Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books in History, a channel on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Michael Van of Sacramento State University. Today, I get to chat about two of my favorite things, the history of imperialism and Star Wars. Yes, Star Wars, the film that changed my life when I saw it as a a 10-year-old boy on the big screen in a massive theater on uh, Kapilani Boulevard in Honolulu in 1977. And I get to talk about it with Dr. Daniel Imrawar, professor of history at Northwestern University, who earned his PhD at UC Berkeley in 2011 after undergraduate studies at both Columbia and Cambridge. Uh, And as we are both UC graduates and UC PhDs, and we were both graduate student union members, and he was a shop steward as a graduate student, I want to throw a shout out of support to the UAW uh, 2865, the graduate student union, who are walking the picket lines as we speak. Now, I'm sure you know his previous work, including Thinking Small, the United States and the Lure of Community Development. Harvard 2015, and the award-winning and best-selling How to Hide an Empire, A Short History of the Greater United States with Farrar, Strauss, and Giraud, 20, uh, 2019. Um, and this How to Hide an Empire has been translated into German, Dutch, Italian, Korean, and Chinese so far. Uh, Dr. Imrawar's writings have appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, The New Republic, The Nation, Dissent, Jacobin Slate, and elsewhere. Uh, I would also note that there are two uh, previous podcasts um, with him on on this network. So, Daniel Imroar. Da- Daniel, if I may, uh, welcome to New Books in History. Yeah, thanks so much for having me back. And I, as I noted, I should say welcome back as you've been on the podcast before for both Thinking Small and How to Hide an Empire. So that, uh, you're a three-time returning champion, um, and this, like Star Wars, is a trilogy. So this is your um, this is your Return of the Jedi episode. That that sets it up to not be the best one. Are you serious? Oh, Empire Strikes Back is the best, right? We'll okay. Yeah. That. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, no, Sorry. No, no. Should yep. we shut no, this podcast no, no, down, no, no. or we can we proceed? No. No. We no. We went. We 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 already went there. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Empire Strikes Back. Um. Anyway. We'll talk about all that later on, though. <laughs> um, to, so today we're going to talk about your article, uh, The Galactic Vietnam, Technology, Modernization, and Empire in George Lucas's Star Wars. And this appeared in Ideology in U.S. Foreign Relations, New Histories, edited by David Milline and Christopher Nichols that came out with Columbia University Press in 2022. Um, before we get into the Galactic Vietnam, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? Um, you started... It, with the history of development aid and then transitioned into a project that integrated uh, imperialism into American history's master narrative. If, is that a, is that a fair summation of your trajectory or how, would, how, yeah. how, 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 how do you, how do you explain yourself and, and yeah. what you do? how do you account for yourself, sir? <laughs> um, I, I think that what I'm, what I tend to be interested in is, finding the interface between global history and U S history. So my first book took, uh, conversation from sort of international politics around development and, and tried to plug the United States into that, including interpreting the war on poverty in the United States as a continuation of some international development projects that the United States had been involved in. Um, the second book was taking the category of colonial empire, which is an absolutely central one in global history and applying it to the United States. Um, and this project too is part of a series of studies of pop culture where, I try to ask not the question that cultural historians always ask, which is sort of what does it feel like to be in the United States and how do class and race and gender politics play out in, in culture, but but rather um, how does the United States' outsize and unique position on the global stage, whether you want to call that empire hegemony or leadership, um, how does that play out in culture? How to have cultural figures and particularly how has pop culture tried to sort through the problems that come with um, the United States' you know, particular um, militarized power in the planet? So the, the big question here would be, um, I mean, addressing this, what, what can Star Wars teach us about American imperialism, right? But before we tackle that, um, I want to ask you what Star Wars means to you. Um, is this a central text uh, for your life? Uh, does it, has this, was, w- were you one of those kids that was deeply influenced by, uh, by the film series growing up? 
I think it's hard not to fall under Star Wars' shadow. Um, but, you know, I've been writing about Star Wars. I've written about Dune. Um, I've written about Donald Duck comic books. And these were things I was aware of when I was younger. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not a Star Wars guy. And it wasn't until I was writing about this that I even watched the prequel trilogy. Um, so... You know, again, it is hard to be to grow up in the United States, especially to grow up male in the United States without, you know, having kind of Luke and Darth, you know, over your shoulder in some minor way, at least. But um, I'm certainly not the biggest Star Wars expert or I didn't come to this as the biggest Star Wars expert or Star Wars devotee, uh, even in my tight social circle. Okay. Well, fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Sorry, I've got did some, I fail you? I've got, no, no. I've, I've got some. I got some colleagues that would be very upset. Yeah. But um, the, the force <laughs> is not strong within me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, look, I no, mean, can yeah. I just say something about that? Because yeah. you know, yeah. it's it, it is often the case that uh, pop culture studies comes from a sort of fan subjectivity, and that's Absolutely. fine, and that can yeah. lead to sort of a deep engagement and a, and a strong subjective sense of, of the power of these texts, and I don't want to deny any of that, but it's, you know, I just want to put out put it out the possibility that Star Wars is analytically interesting even if you don't fall for it, even if you're not totally living in its thrall, um, and, and I've, you know, had to sort of think through what it is to be really interested historically in these texts without sort of enacting that as a, like, this is just a way to like, you know, find pleasure in academia because I'm researching my true passions. Mm -hmm. No, you made me think of, um, I was at a couple of conferences years ago. One was on television in the cold war and the other was on, uh, some aspect of film in the cold war. Um, and, um, at the TV cold war, there were, um, there was someone who was really big into Buffy, the vampire slayer. Yeah. Yeah. That'll and do that. Buffy, and that was clear. I mean, individuals doing solid, solid work, but clearly coming from the fandom perspective. And I think maybe a little blind to some critiques sort of because <laughs> yeah. they're, they're so emotionally invested. Right. So, and, and I think actually Buffy is a really good contrast case because it is almost unthinkable that someone would devote a lot of time to studying, um, the, you know, Buffy to do Buffy studies, which is really a thing at this point, um, without, without yeah. having that feeling that a lot of people have when they watch Buffy, which is like, this show is amazing and is unique and is different from all other shows. But Star Wars, I think it's entirely possible to, to study it without that, because unlike Buffy, which was sort of hit a, a very particular, scratched a very particular itch, um, Star Wars is just everything culture. So it's actually a fairly good way to get a handle on the politics of the United States is to study the movie that not only was, you know, one of the sort of, you know, highest grossing movies, but it just made the deepest cultural impact, like getting a handle on what the politics of that movie are. That tells you a lot about the United States, whether you have any particular attachment to the movie or not. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, and and I'll I'll, I'll confess, like I, I I will deny that I'm like sci-fi guy, or but then when really forced into it to think about it, yeah, I I, I am kind of that Star Wars nerd, and um, I've been, I I've even published a couple of articles with Star Wars titles. One, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, the dark side, it's, it's French becoming monsters, and then uh, the one I was most proud of uh, was um, and not just the men, but the women and children too gendered images of violence mm. in Indonesian, Vietnamese, and Cambodian Cold War museums. That's a, yeah, it's yeah. kind of a deep cut to the prequels. Um, um, a, a quote that actually had really uh, would be served by some serious academic unpacking because it gets into the whole representation of the indigenous in, in the films, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I digress. Um, so yeah, I mean, you already sort of addressed how the the significance of Star Wars in American culture. Um, I mean, is there is there anything do you think that comes is comparable to it, or is this like like really the the great sort of hegemonic cultural influence? I mean, is there anything comparable? Or yeah, I mean, there have been mega texts before. I just made that word up, but but you know what I mean, like things that. Yeah just seem like it's not just, you know, a book that everyone buys or a TV show that everyone watches briefly and then forgets about. But, you know, you've said that you were touched by this, like seeing it at 10, that was an event in your life. That was an event in a lot of people's lives. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's hard to think of cultural texts um, that have that kind of power. So both breadth in terms of, you know, it's it's really hard to be in the United States without having seen or be familiar with Star Wars. Even if you haven't seen the trilogy, you know the central plot twists, like you know what happens with Darth Vader's Luke's father, all that kind of stuff. Um, oh, 
I ruined it. I ruined it. Oh my God. This is why you shouldn't have had me back. Um, but, but it's also depth, right? That a lot of people who've seen it, you know, are not just like passingly familiar with the movie and kind of, kind of remember it, but, but, you know, have dressed up as characters, you know, have quoted it in like, you know, important moments in their lives or in important articles they've written, that kind of thing. I mean, I, I can't think of a single text that, that goes so deep and so wide. Um, certainly in the, not after, well, not after world war two. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. And like the, you're in the article, the initial sort of situating of the film series and its significance, it really made me think. Like, I, I cannot think of anything comparable. I mean, obviously, now we're getting this Marvel stuff crammed down our throat, which I, I cannot, I don't know nothing about it, cannot connect to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this constant barrage of Marvel stuff, and it's going to be ephemeral. I mean, it's not leaving. That's deep, right. Yeah. How deep are people going to go with Ant Man? I mean, I think there's there's just yeah. going to be limits, right? It's it's successful entertainment, but I don't think, I don't think a lot of that stuff is going to have the staying power that Star Wars has had. Yeah, and and maybe it was a. I mean, well, maybe. I mean, you you tell me. Um, was this a function of the time? Um, you know, coming out with the first film comes out in seventy seven. Um, I mean, there there were fewer options. Um, now we are inundated with cultural output. Um. It's not just going down to the movies, uh, to the theater, right? It's not just, um, it's not, uh, you know, uh, having three channels of uh, television uh, available. There's, you know, all the streaming services, everything's available at the touch of the screen. Yeah. And it may, maybe are we in a technological age where, in a consumerist age where the, the, the replication of that kind of hegemonic cultural product is, probably isn't isn't going to happen again i'm not sure uh i i don't know that star wars success had to do with the lack of of other or better options um i i mean i think that when you get that level of enthusiasm it it tends to to solve some kind of problem and i mean one thing that i mean you could just argue that maybe the film is just good in a kind of you know uninteresting sort of way this is good filmmaking um but i think that one reason people are drawn to it is that it, it speaks to them on a deep level. So then it kind of comes to us scholars to, to figure out what, what that resonance is. I actually, you know, it occurs to me, there is another text post star Wars in our, you know, multiplex Twitter universe that still really has stood out, which is Harry Potter. So it's not, you know, we're getting messages all over, but people grow up with Harry Potter. Like people think about Harry Potter. I don't know that it quite has the depths of star Wars or, or the width, but, um, but that's a good that's a good example of like a set of texts that have really done something. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, but I think one difference there is that they came out first as books. Yeah, and as increasingly thick books, and were targeted um, or were designed in a way to be read at, at several different age levels. Yep. Um, and um, at a time when people still read. <laughs> Before, before the the little devices in our pockets took over our lives, where someone would sit down and and wait for a book, and then that transition from from you know literary phenomenon to a big blockbuster, yeah, uh, that's different. I mean, because the, the the I mean, I remember when the Star Wars novels came out after the first film, and they were, I mean, as a kid, I knew they were terrible. And it was clear that they were trying to create some sort of other marketing to, to follow in the, uh, the wake of the film's success. That's right. Um, yeah. I remember reading a couple of those little paperbacks, little hash at paperbacks. Um, <laughs> anyway, but um, yeah, that's, that's yeah. Harry Potter. Um, so in addition to star Wars, as you mentioned, you've written about Dune and uh, uh, talking about indigeneity and empire there, as well as analyses of Donald duck and the ugly American. Um can you say a little bit more about using popular culture as this avenue for historical investigation? Um, you know, I, you've got a you got an enthusiastic interlocutor here right now because I've I've done some work on Hawaii Five O and and yeah. in in French imperialism used popular cultural artifacts from the late nineteenth early twentieth century to to study the French Empire. So I I'm sold here. But how do how do you explain this to maybe more skeptical? Uh, colleagues that this is a real scholarly endeavor yeah so let's think about that i think people take um take for granted or at least easily accept the proposition that high culture is of interest right and if you can find some particularly far-seeing artist or intellectual or philosopher that probing the nuances of their cultural production or their intellectual production 
is is useful, right? Is a way of understanding the currents of the time. So I think people are down with that. Then I think um, many of us are also very comfortable with the idea that pop culture can do similar things, although perhaps there's some suspicion about that. So let me lay out the claim. Um, the The claim is that for something to be wildly popular in the way that Star Wars is, um, it has to. There has to be some level on which it is doing really important cultural work and doing it right. And so when we experience this as, you know, in our sort of, con- you know, in our contemporary world, when, you know, when we see a movie and we're just like, God damn, that movie's good. Like, just like, I love it. Like that scene is perfect. And, you know, like everything that happens just seems like it, it pops, like it's just right. It fits, you know, we don't always have the words to explain why, like why that each scene just sort of does it for us. Um, but you know, that feeling of like, yeah, that's right. That's how it's, that's what it's supposed to look like. That's what makes me feel good in, in whatever way that I'm seeking to feel good. So you've got these, a few of these texts that really just work like that. And that sort of fit, you can either see them as sort of puzzle pieces that just sort of fit perfectly, um, with, with the culture, just like slot right in there, or you can see them as, as creating a culture, right. As doing big work. And, and sometimes that's because the, the cultural products themselves, the films have just been focus grouped really well. And, you know, a lot of people thought, okay, we tried this out. If the, if the heroine says this, it's going to piss people off. So she has to say it like that. And then that'll work. Uh, or sometimes as in the case with George Lucas, it just seems like there was a kind of, visionary understanding of what filmgoers would be really interested in and really enthusiastic about. Um, so when you see those moments of a, a text just popping and working, um, I think that that gives you a big invitation to start asking some questions um, because, you know, it's, it's really hard to understand what people broadly are thinking, but these um, wildly popular cultural texts are, I think, actually really good windows into a sort of large cultural understanding of, in this case, the relationship between the United States and the rest of the world. Mm, yeah. And, and one of the things you um, you said there really made me think that, you know, this is the the three original films really are George Lucas's product. I mean, he is the auteur yeah. in a way that is in the, like in the great tradition of, of filmmaking, right? Yeah. Uh, whereas, I don't know, based on... Um, some of the the later later installments. I mean, it's it's almost culture not worse than culture done by committee is culture done by algorithm, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. focus group and and um, you know the sort of the the critique of the Netflix uh, productions that are designed to for the interest of the algorithm. So that that make you know that that leads to the next question I want to ask you. You know what what how do we how do you fit George Lucas, the the individual, the the filmmaker, into this particular moment in American history that you're talking about in the piece. You're going from the 1960s into the 1970s and in, into the 1980s, but really focused on this tra- this transit transition about 15 years, where the United States goes through these profound changes domestically and in its relationship with uh, with the rest of the world, um, and um, and is obviously tied to the American war in Vietnam. So how, how, how does George Lucas as an individual fit into that uh, period in history? And how is he, he enlightening? Let's just say the obvious thing first, which is yeah. that, you know, sometimes you'll talk to undergraduates about this kind of thing and they'll say, Star Wars isn't about US politics. Star Wars is about, you know, a, a galaxy far away in a time long, long time ago. Uh, and, and so they're right in that sense. Um, it's not, explicitly taking up the um, political predicaments of the United States, but it's about the rise and fall of empire. It's about the clash of cultures. I mean, these are very loud issues and particularly they're loud in George Lucas's ears because um, he, I mean, he, he lived through um, the U S participation in the Vietnam war. It had been obviously an incredibly important event in his life. Um, He'd considered leaving the country uh, in order to dodge the draft. Uh, And it, it seems totally obvious that star Wars, i mean not just like obvious to me as a scholar but it was obvious to people at a time at the time you can see this when you read the reviews that people are writing of star wars this is about vietnam uh and and viewers recognized it about vietnam and it, it's i mean i think we all have that i don't think that's a shock to hear but i think it it's helpful to unpack that and also to recognize where george lucas stood 
on the whole Vietnam question. Um, he was a countercultural figure. He had a beard at a time when having a beard meant something. Uh, he lived in San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, he, listener, listeners to the podcast will not realize that uh, both of us have beards right now. Yeah, go that's on. right. Exactly. <laughs> lived now in San there means nothing. Now there means nothing. nothing. <laughs> yeah, it could go either way. We're, we're exactly. established. We're I think we both have left beards, but you know, they would work either. I work in either direction. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, so like you have to understand George Lucas as part of the anti-war left and you have to understand him as so consumed with the Vietnam War that it affects, I mean, not just Star Wars, but it affects his whole corpus. Um, and you can you can see his, you know, all of his films uh, in the 70s uh, and even into the 80s as as just ways to think through the, the problems of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And so, so the reviewers in the late 70s are seeing Vietnam in this? Yes, absolutely. 100%. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not every, every review, but it, yeah, it's, it's not uncommon for people to say, look, this is a Vietnam war film. I mean, there's just, and there's including stuff that we don't recognize as like Vietnam references. There's this whole business about the targeting system, like this advanced targeting system that Luke is supposed to use. And that's, that felt very evident to people as exactly the kind of conversations that are be, are being had about uh, Vietnam era military stuff. That wasn't totally obvious to me when I watched. I wasn't like thinking that's the Vietnam yeah. moment, but but there's a lot of stuff. So both it's it's kind of audible enough that we can still hear it, but it was more audible to people at the time. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I, it, so admittedly, I was ten when the first one came yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, successfully, you know, therefore, dodging the draft. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, although <laughs> I've at a certain point I get, I get these questions about, you know, being a, being a scholar of Vietnam, you know, did I serve? And I'm like, how old do you think I am? Yeah. Like, yeah. I was, yeah. I was born six months before the Tet Offensive. Come on. Um, but, um, so that's interesting because my reaction as, as a 10 year old was, um, I saw World War II. I saw Nazis. I read it as uh, the the empire being Nazism and the rebels being I don't know, like, uh, you know, French resistancy kind of stuff. Yeah, and um, I so the, you know, reading reading this article, it was really eye opening for me because I had not put it into that American Vietnam. American war in Vietnam context. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but like just, just the, the, the fascist imagery is just so strong that that's what I associated with as that in, in that age group at that time. Yeah. And that's not crazy. I mean, there's clearly fascist Im imagery there too. Um, so there's two things to say about it. And let me just start yeah. with the first thing, um, which is that we also know a little bit about the backstory of how these films are made. And um, we have early drafts and, you know, George Lucas explains that the planet Alderaan, which is being vaporized by the empire is initially in his conception, um, is like North Vietnam. Uh, so like, that's how he lays it out. Uh, and that's, he, that's, that's just such an amazing insight. Um, yeah. Yeah. And he really, really taken when you, when I, when I, uh, when I encountered that. Um, and he also uh, tried to, he wanted to cast the Jedi um, as Asian actors, Asia being the site of a lot of the United States' uh, imperial wars. And, um, you know, took that pretty seriously. And even though they ended up all being white actors, except for um, James Earl Jones, um, the, the, uh, you can see the mark of the sort of Jedi as Asian uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, first of all, their names are sounds like, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Yoda, this is like a sort of Japanese flavor. Um, the name Jedi itself comes from a, a Japanese word. A lot of Darth Vader's outfits, you know, that is also derived from Japanese cinema. You can see the mark of Akira Kurosawa on the films pretty easily. Um, and then I, I, I had this hadn't occurred to me, Han Solo, Han being the name of the Chinese ethnicity. So there's all kinds of ways in which you're kind of urged to see the Jedi as, as Asian, uh, and, and the central plot tension for, um, for George Lucas. And this is very clear from his table talk around, around it. And from his early scripts is that this is about a small, weak and kind of vaguely Asian country or set of countries facing an empire. Mm -hmm. And he understand explicitly understands that empire to be the United States. Um, and we know that the big way, that this is most clear is that um, before he'd worked on Star Wars, um, George Lucas had worked on another film, which he'd intended to make called Apocalypse Now. 
he was supposed to make that film, not Francis Ford Coppola. And he got like, he worked on it for years. It wrote a script. It blew my mind when I, when I read this. So I mean, I was going to ask you about this later on, but tell, tell us more about this. Like, what happened, and, and also, what would that have looked like? I'm, I'm a little, maybe not that enthusiastic about a Lucas version of Apocalypse Now. Oh, what, well, what I can you, tell what, you what, what it looked like. Done? Yeah, please, please. Yeah, be, well, we know. Okay, so here's what happened. Uh, so Lucas and Coppola were close, uh, and Coppola had this idea that someone should make the uh, make a movie of Conrad's Heart of Darkness, uh, and that was that was to be Apocalypse Now. So Lucas works on it, works on it with this amazing total right-wing uh filmmaker john milius who, who's a total right-winger but also super fascinating oh incredibly I mean, important i mean do we have half an hour to just do milius like we could he, that could be the next half hour of our discussion he's the, he's the basis of um walter uh subject in the big lebowski john milius is the basis of three different characters in major films uh that oh, that are man. recognizable so he's in uh american graffiti uh, he's the, which is a George Lucas film. He's the race car driver, the, like the hero. Um, he's also in Apocalypse Now, which he helped to write, Colonel Kilgore. I love mm-hmm. the smell of napalm in the morning. That is based on Milius. And also Milius wrote those lines. Also, Milius wrote the Dirty Harry speech. Do you feel lucky, punk? Like every oh. intrusion of like really memorable, just kind of like violent fascism into our cinematic cinematic imagination turns out to be Milius. Uh, he directed Red Dawn. He did Conan the Barbarian. The guy is unstoppable big wednesday i don't know what you're talking about the, the surfing film big wednesday was he behind did he do that? that too he's a I surfing believe, guy yeah yeah no he, that that was his uh God his damn. take which where, where vietnam is a central uh yeah uh, uh plot point there i totally yeah that that sounds it's anyway it's, don't don't, gonna, don't hold me i'm gonna, I'm gonna afterwards we'll I'm gonna stop with milius right now yeah, just because yeah. otherwise we'll get sucked into the Milius yeah. vortex but um but so, so lucas is working with his buddy who's actually really right wing yeah and, and there's a, you know i mean vietnam this, obsessed but from different perspectives they're both super vietnam obsessed and and there, there's this kind of nice possibility i mean Milius works well with people who don't share his political views and he sort of mm-hmm. you know adds a little burst of of you know sort of violent uh violent uh insanity uh right at their uh, crucial moments in filmmaking um so but anyway so lucas is they're to the point where they are scouting locations. There's scripts, like he knows how what it's supposed to look like. Um, and but also it is really hard to get a critical film made about Vietnam, which is exactly what Apocalypse Now is is going to be. There's Lucas feels that he's fighting the studio system and losing. And that's true because like for a lot of the 70s, it really, you know, the films about Vietnam are like Green Berets with uh John Wayne. It's really hard to get a critical film made. So because he's dispirited by that, Lucas realizes that he can translate his films into a space opera and so he takes apocalypse now and that becomes the basis for star wars uh which comes out just at the moment that vietnam films are starting to tumble out of studios and the one of the crucial scenes in lucas's apocalypse now is going to be this he describes it at this group of non-technical people who are you know barely armed and are just have like slings and catapults or sorry slingshots and and spears and that kind of thing who are taking on a big technological empire that in star wars becomes uh the ewoks fighting the empire that was supposed that was originally supposed to be an earlier part of the star wars trilogy that's lucas's understanding of the vietnam war that's what he thinks the vietnam war looks like and that's what lucas's apocalypse now would have looked like which is actually quite different from coppola's apocalypse now yeah yeah i i mean (laughs) That that's so, that's just that's such a fascinating alternate uh, universe because I mean that that was also a really important film for me as a kid. I mean, yeah, my dad yeah. took me and saw it in the theater. I think I was twelve, which was maybe a little too young to see that in yeah, the theater. Yeah. But that's what we did in those days. And, uh, by the way, John Milius did do a Big Wednesday, which uh, yeah, was what yet, he yet do? another really. For, I mean, I'm a surfer, and my dad okay. was a surfer, so it really was another formative film for you know uh, a young Mike Van learning to be Mike Van. <laughs> So, um, so, um, what was, what was Lucas's take on technology? Cause that's, that's a big part of your, um, of your analysis and you, you tie his tinkering with hot rods in the central Valley. Was it, was he from Stockton? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. Stockton yeah. central Valley. Yeah. Um, and it, and it's, it's central to both American graffiti, um, which I, I saw that as a really young kid too. And in my early mind, I thought American graffiti was totally tied to happy days. 
I thought it was like the film version of Happy Days, and there was some it, connection it there. It shares a. It, I mean, that's not wrong. It, it that's not wrong like, to think like, that. In, in my in my my my, my little mind, that was that was all the same. But um, anyway, the hot rod tinkering is uh, you see it in American Graffiti, where they're literally hot rod tinkering. Yeah. But then you see it in the in the sci fi space opera format in Star Wars, um, working on the Millennium Falcon, for example. I mean, Han Solo and Chewbacca are always tinkering with it, and even even Luke is tinkering with things on um, in the uh, first Tatooine. thing you see is he's repairing droids yeah so what 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 does this mean what's the significance here so star wars has or the star wars heroes have a really interesting relationship to technology and there's a few different things going on but um i just want to point this obvious thing out the empire has all the good tech like the empire's yeah. tech is like big and gleaming and expensive and capital intensive it never works but you know that's that's what the empire has it has like well, t- tell that to the people of alderaan Right. Okay. So yes, it can work. Uh, but you know, there's always like a hack a way Never around forget. it. That's right. And we, we should get into Alaron because I that's also an important moment. Um so and then the heroes either have they have like one of three things. Either they have like stolen and rusted and secondhand tech. Um, and that's I think a direct reference to the sort of, you know, masculine culture of like working on hot rods that George Lucas was very much a part of uh when he was growing up in California. And that's what you see a lot of in American graffiti, basically like people are always just, you know, holding wrenches and rags. Um, and that's exactly true in star Wars. I mean, even Leia, I think at one point picks up an arc welder. Um, and, uh, so either they're just like constantly working on grease stained things that, you know, that like kind of work, but there's always a human labor aspect. Like it's like hunk of junk can get you from one side of the galaxy to another, but you know, it's, it's never going to be pretty. Um, and that's sort of the used universe aesthetic that, that Lucas really leaned into, or they eschew technology altogether and they go in for something mystical and that's the force. And that's Luke discarding the targeting mechanism and, and just sort of using his mind's eye. Um, or you see what the Ewoks do where they just, you know, have like, rope bridges and slingshots and that kind of thing, like a very primitive form of technology. But all of these are ways of not having the kind of powerful, expensive technology and destructive technology that the empire has. And this all feeds into a critique of the United States that, that Lucas has. He sees the United States, very explicitly sees the United States as the empire. Uh, and so one of the, um, uh, one of the failures of, of, of the United States has become, and this is a common critique of uh, from the left of the Vietnam War, is that the United States has become invested in solving its problems with destructive military technologies at, at an unspeakable human cost. That's a critique of the Vietnam War that's common in Lucas's time. You can absolutely read that in Star Wars. Hmm. Hmm. So what, what, I mean, what the, the Death Star is the big piece of technology and what, exactly. what does that represent? I mean, this is the, the machine that kills Alderaan and you said you wanted to speak a little bit more about, about yeah, that. Yeah. So I, I mean, there's a, right. So it's, so it, it transparently represents the kind of, you know, he, you know, planes with wingspans the size of football fields that the United States is flying over Vietnam and the idea that the Death Star would destroy Alderaan, which, you um, Lucas has a, in his script as representing North Vietnam. Um, that's pretty transparent reference to the to the Vietnam War. I think there's another overlay too, which feeds into Lucas's anti technology stuff, um, which is that he's fighting with the studio system, um, and he sees this st- at a time when the studios have all the really good and expensive stuff, and the cameras, and uh, and and the sets, and it's really hard to get a movie made without going through the studios. What Lucas does is try to secede from the Southern California studios based in Hollywood and start making movies in Northern California using computers, which, you know, now in this world of CGI, like that is the form that capital takes when it wants to make a film. But in Lucas's day, that's like a hack. That's a way to get around the really expensive studio technologies and to like make cool movies when you don't have all the money to build all the sets. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was talking about um, your art. I sent it to a friend of mine and I was talking about it and uh, he was saying, you know, for, for him, Lucas represents a really a neoliberal turn in his reading. And I was thinking about the um, the California ideology as put forward by uh, Richard Barbrook and um, Andy Cameron in the, in the nineties. Right. And then uh, Paris Marx talks about this a lot and tech won't save us. And the, and the other sort of techno skeptics talk about the California ideology, arguing that the Silicon Valley techno optimism yeah. and um, breaking away from what they see as 
the conservative forces um, actually kind of maybe inadvertently lays the groundwork for the neoliberal turn that Northern California has come to represent. Yeah. You know, on that one, and I see that this transition from that that optimism, which I, I you know, I, as a child of the seventies, I remember that kind of thing, and I can see George Lucas there. But then, what does Skywalker Ranch become? I mean, it, it, it with the that. Did you see what I'm saying there? That shift. Totally. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I, look, I mean, this is you know, this is everyone's story. Is you think you're yeah. driving the Millennium Falcon, and it actually turns mm-hmm. out you're navigating the Death Star. And you know, I mean, <laughs> Lucas starts out in exactly the way that you know Stuart Brand, and Steve Jobs, and all these California guys do, yeah. feeling that they're the insurgents, mm-hmm. right? And they're they're latching onto technology, but it's a, sort of a garage technology, and there's like the humanistic element is really you know brought to the fore, and they're going to be disruptive, and they're going to take down these big inefficient behemoths. I mean, this is literally what Star Wars is visualizing, and this is. What one reason why it's so exciting to particularly that set of people, um, you know, and then what is the actual effect right now? We have Star Wars as the as the behemoth, the entertainment behemoth. We have, you know, Lucas, not just, you know, like all the entertainment franchises that he founded, not just Star Wars, but Pixar, that's Lucas, uh, THX, that's Lucas, like Industrial Light and Magic, that's Lucas. I mean, like we are now living in the world where Lucas's properties are the are the you know kings of of all the collective hills um and and the the ethos is you know we're the rebels but of, absolutely not right you guys are the stormtroopers at this point <laughs> yeah. um so um can you say a little bit more about the ewoks in lucas's imagination um and how they fit into his reaction to the war in vietnam i mean it's is are the notes are that they, they represent Vietnamese and the, and the yeah. battle on, um, what, what, forgive me, is it? Endor. That, that's Endor. Forest that's Endor. Endor. Okay. Yeah. That's Endor, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, that's that's my read is, I mean, it literally he just takes a the plot from Apocalypse Now and, and then now it's the Ewoks instead of the Viet Cong. Um, so there's a pretty easy transposition there. And I, I guess you could have two reactions to it. One is, and I think this is really worth just sitting with, is oh my God, this guy made an incredibly popular movie where the Vietnamese are like taking out, you know, U.S. ships and, um, you know, U.S. bases and we're all cheering like mad for it. So that in itself is interesting. I mean, that is really deeply interesting. Um, And if you're going to make a case for the progressive animus behind Star Wars, I think that would be a big part of it. But let's also probe the other part of this. So if, you know, uh, the Ewoks represent the Vietnamese or stand in for, for the Vietnamese or the sort of victims of imperialism in a broader sense, you never really get the Ewok perspective. In fact, the Ewoks can't talk. They just like, they're like cute. They just like gurgle, right? And and that is something that is really distinctive about um, Lucas's films is that he is, I think it's, re- it's, it's, you have to see him as an anti-imperialist, right? The films are about attacks on empire. The films literally, I mean, literally the film is about how to take down an empire. Um, so, so that's a huge part of Lucas's um, ethos. But on the other hand, it's never from a deep curiosity about the colonized themselves. And in fact, it's, it's, it's always rather this kind of weird power struggle, dynastic struggle within the Skywalker family. So the way to bring down the empire isn't for the, colonized to revolt and to, you know, establish their own rule, or at least, you know, take claw back their own sovereignty. It's for the, the son to, to, to redeem the father. Uh, and so this whole battle, you know, which maps so clearly onto the Vietnam war is not really a battle between peoples. It's just a battle for the soul of the Skywalkers or the United States. And the whole thing is expressed as a drama between white people. Um, and that, that, that is, not just going on in Star Wars, um, Lucas does make some Vietnam film, uh, some Vietnam films. Uh, the American Graffiti franchise goes to Vietnam at one point. And it's amazing because he has a a, a film, American Graffiti 2, that's set in Vietnam, direct, the Vietnam parts are directed by Lucas. It's very critical of the Vietnam War, and you do not see a single Vietnamese person represented. Like yeah, they're just no. not even there. Like that's no. not the criticism of the Vietnam. The criticism of the war has nothing to do with the Vietnamese people. They're just scenery. Yeah, it's 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 dealing with American issues. Um, but have you seen the um the Star Wars fan film? Uh, uh, I think it's called Alone. No, the I've never heard of run. it. It's a it's up on YouTube. It's called Alone Stormtrooper on the Run, and it's about a stormtrooper who is alone on um uh, uh Endor, 
and he's okay. being he's being stalked by the Ewoks, who Ooh. are dangerous and bloodthirsty, and it's super dark. Wow! <laughs> and uh, I think it was, it was shot up in, in Northern California. Um, um, so uh, on the Ewoks, one of the things that struck me in the article is you had this quote where he says um, he's talking about like that 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 horrible horrible end of. Um, um, Return of the Jedi, Jedi. Where there's the, oh, the, sorry, party, Return of the Jedi. Yeah. party at the end of uh, oh yeah, yeah uh, the drums yeah just yeah, yeah that's, it, that's the worst it was just just so cringe and um and actually I I saw an, someone did an article uh, uh, about a year ago saying that um uh you know if if you look at what happened with the destruction of that second Death Star around the orbit of Endor. All the Ewoks are dead because of the, uh, the 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 fallout and all the the metal that would have been rained down on the planet, and they would have been wiped out. Um, so that the Ewoks are dead. It was kind of a buzzkill. But um, in in your article, there you have a quote where he says um, he invent he he imagined that scene as the quote fuzzy wuzzies having a big party, right? The little fuzzy wuzzies. Yeah, that's yeah, that's how he's that. describing the end of the movie. Yeah. Um, that's a really troubling term. Um, <laughs> that's a Kipling poem, yeah. Fuzzy Wuzzy. Yeah, and that, that's a, that's about colonial warfare, and it's it's a it's, racist it's, term. It's a it's a really racist term, but it's, yeah. but it's it's that weird Kipling racism where he's actually praising these warriors. They fought with the Mahdi in uh, in Sudan. Yeah, after um, after uh, 1885 and before. Um, before uh, the Battle of Omdurman in, in 19, uh, 1898. Um, and it's he's actually praising their bravery, but it's this super racist term. Yeah. And I, I, it, it just it just hit me with the colonial reference there. But that that seems to wash over Lucas and that would that would go with what you were saying that it's about the perspective of the white male imperialist, right? I mean, there's two reads on that. I, I, I yeah. went back and forth on how to treat that episode when I was writing about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. because yeah, you're, you're right. And it's, it's a racist term, but it's not a racist term that resonates loudly in the U S vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's much more audible in the British vocabulary. And I mm -hmm. believe one of the primary references is Papua New Guinea about which Lucas knows very little. So yeah. you, you can have two reads, right? One is you're like, yes, yet again, Lucas is revealing something that is not particularly hidden, uh, which is that he has a extremely condescending view of non-white people, even when he's sympathetic to them, or at least worried about violence done to them. Uh, this is not, you know, this doesn't come out of deep cultural curiosity and it's, and it's you know, bathed in stereotypes. And, and we can talk about the other ways in which that pops up in the Star Wars franchise. But um, so you're like, okay, yeah, of course he would refer to you know, these people who are coded as indigenous or, you know, colonized in some way as fuzzy wuzzies with this racist term. On the other hand, it's not totally obvious to me how much Lucas has an, has a kind of grasp on that vocabulary. Yeah. And yeah. the Ewoks literally are like, if anyone, if, if, if anyone actually deserves to be called little fuzzy wuzzy, like it is like that is actually appropriate. So I couldn't tell if this was like, there was a whole Kipling esque kind yeah. of backstory here, or if, if I was just like, Fair enough. He's describing like fuzzy bears, like that. That yeah. like it's inappropriate to describe humans, but it is not totally inappropriate to describe these creatures that he's invented. Yeah, I want to ask you a little more about some of the 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 racial issues in the series. But um, I just want to point out that uh, a second ago you had mentioned um, you know, it's pretty wild that um, we have this major blockbuster film that gets us to cheer for an allegory of the Vietnamese. Yeah, um, defeating um. Yeah. Defeating uh, the American Empire and taking down the walkers. You know, they wrap the, the wires yeah. around them yeah. and all that. Using low tech, they can take yeah. down an Imperial yeah. Walker. Um, Spielberg's uh, War of the Worlds um, with Tom Cruise, right? Yeah. The face of America. Yeah. Um, the key moment in that film is when um, uh, the, the the big alien walker things um, are, 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 are taking the humans and going to harvest them or whatever. And I think he's with his daughter and some other some other humans, and he takes a, an explosive bunch of explosives and ties them to himself, and he goes up into the alien craft. This film is done in two thousand five. Yeah, and he's a suicide bomber. He, it's a suicide bomber. He's a jihadi. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, mean, so, I remember being in the theater going, that, 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 "That's Iraq. That's Iraq." Yeah. But that seemed to wash right over everyone. Um. It it doesn't it doesn't so yeah. I mean one reason I'm interested in Star Wars is not just 
you know, it itself, but I think either it marks a shift in culture or it, it helps affect the shift. But after Star Wars, it is not unusual for films to allegorically pit the United States or U.S. foreign policy as the enemy. Like that happens in film after film and in blockbuster after blockbuster. You know, I mean, at the Avengers, like there's like the Craven, like, you know, corrupt CIA guys, like that's part of like, you, like it, it is not hard to read the Avengers franchise as a, as a not very veiled criticism of U.S. foreign policy. Um, the highest grossing film of all time, Avatar. I mean, it is a bit of a mystery how that is the highest grossing film of all time, because unlike Star Wars, it left no cultural memory whatsoever. And I mean, name the, Name well, the lead char- name hey, a character in Avatar. Give, give, you give know? us a couple uh, the blue people. Uh, we'll give us <laughs> give, give us a couple weeks. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see what happens. We'll see. We'll if it, see. But, we'll see. <laughs> but let me point that. I mean, that film is virulently anti-imperialist with yeah. the United States of the Empire. I mean, there's no other way to read those politics, right? This is. Yep. I mean, I'm not saying that this is you know the wokest film ever. I'm not saying it gets like indigenous politics or culture right, but like. It it's it's got a it's a there's a cheering section and it's 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 on one side not the other side. So the, Star Wars the enemy from, is the U.S. Marine Corps. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like it's, it's, it's completely unhidden. Yeah. So for me, Star Wars is is partly interesting because it's this weird moment in U.S. culture where it suddenly becomes fashionable, okay, and indeed sort of helpful for audiences to root against their own country, and and so you get this weird thing where you have anti-imperialism represented and invoked and 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 played out again and again in in movie theaters and people really investing in it and people like you and me can like watch those movies and be like yeah you know like i get that politics and yet they're still in the united states and the united states is like it's like their own government is still the enemy and it just keeps going on and it's kind of a mystery how that is allowed to happen or how that can happen in a in a you know ostensibly democratic polity uh and you start to wonder if the films don't allow just some sort of, you know, venting of, of, of some anxieties with us foreign policy that, you know, once, once they've been properly vented, you can just sort of go back to like, you know, being okay with, uh, you know, whatever the Democrats and Republicans are doing in Iraq. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I wonder if you could just muse a bit more on the, um, on the, the really problematic race stuff and the, in yeah. the first three films, I mean, in the first film, everyone's white, right? <laughs> everyone's white in uh, new hope right and then in the se- in um uh empire strikes back uh we get a black character lando calrissian yeah but then he turns out to be hedonistic oversexed and duplicitous untrustworthy right yeah yeah um yeah. the prequel the prequels um in which lucas makes the yeah. so episodes one two three they're full of like these anti-semitic and sinophobic mm-hmm. um, aliens that are you know caricatures of anti-semitic and sinophobic um the tuscan raiders i mean <laughs> they're referred to as quote sand people right i mean there's yeah, like yeah there's yeah. all this this veil uh, veiled and, and sometimes not veiled um uh r- r- issues around race and xenophobia and and also the indigenous um yeah um what's going on there what i mean how do you how do you read this is it is it just sort of naive is it no, you're you're totally right. I mean, so let's let's just name some of the big ones just so we have the the inventory. Um, it is not hard to see the droids um, R two D two and C three PO as doing a sort of minstrel act, and there's a lot of direct kind of you know line between that that form of entertainment. Aren't, aren't, and, they, aren't they based on the Kurosawa film, the Hidden yeah, Fortress? It is also from uh, Hidden yeah. Fortress, a Kurosawa film. I mean, but, so but you, those you, are, but in the American context, you read it as, as a minstrel reference? Well, it's two different yeah. strands, right? It's clear yeah. that they are derived from that Kurosawa film, but it's also yeah. clear that a lot of minstrel performance is going into, especially C-3PO, basically. Um, oh, okay. And uh, Chewbacca, I mean, Lucas describes Chewbacca's character as the trusty native. And there's also a there long is. history of okay. the, like, you know, the Tonto figure, right? The sort of, mm-hmm. you know, loyal indigenous person who helps the hero out, but doesn't really, you know, interfere in the action in any in any interesting way so a lot of people noticed that at the end of the first um star wars film when everyone's like getting medals chewbacca just stands there like he's not a sexually available like potential love interest for uh leia he doesn't like he's not like awarded rewarded in any way he's just like there well, he's, he's too tall to put the metal on yeah yeah and 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 actually they fix that later um in 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 the in later film they particularly go out of their way to try to fix that um oh but, did, they, did they digitally re 
at no, a, no. A there's moment. one scene in one of the like um, the next the three that come after where they like make yeah. a they like address that moment. So I forget exactly how they do it, and like they're okay. like they're like okay, we're not we're not playing that game anymore. Which you know, okay. fine, great. <laughs> um, but you know, and George Lucas was very clear. He's like, this is a native person, and then he said of the Ewoks, who, whose name comes from the Miwok people, who had. Um, you know, uh, originally yeah, near the, the Skywalker ranch. Yeah, that's Northern California. Yeah, yeah. He says the Ewoks are just the Wookiees, but chopped into. It's the same character type. It's it's indigenous, right? So yeah, all of that's there, and and I think the what you get from that is that Lucas is someone who, you know, basically is interested. Uh, you know, like a lot of people who are producing entertainment around him basically interested in the plight and the spiritual journey of white people and, and sees everyone else as, you know, some, you know, the comic entertainment, you know, the, the person to be saved, like they're not the protagonists and, mm-hmm. and often they're stereotyped and, and often very crude and, and, and frank, frankly, some, sometimes quite offensive ways. Um, but, but there's no sense that subjectivity lies anywhere except in the Skywalker clan. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, that's interesting because it also makes me think of sort of, um, again, the cultural milieu that I grew up in and observed my, my particularly my dad operating in of sort of the, the late seventies new age movement and the influence of that on, um, on, uh, on the star Wars films. I mean, he mentions Carlos Castaneda, yeah. um, but I, um, so I'll just full confession time here. This, this episode is getting a little autobiographical, but I, I grew up in an est household. Your hearts and ours and training. Hey, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, this I mean, is this good. Is, I, and so uh, I can tell you that in the Est world, of which I was a precocious young little Est hole, um, Star Wars was big. And Star Wars came up in the seminars and brought in the training. And they, and I think it was particularly important because it like, like Est, it was um, – commercialized zen it was marketed zen yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and we sorry go, i mean don't mean yeah, to interrupt, yeah, no, go i mean this is so this it made me think of this and i was just wondering if you could speak to that sort of that that new age sort of the new aginess of it yeah uh, so. so that's that's directly in there that's not an accident um so lucas was reading that kind of stuff he was particularly reading a series of books by um carlos castaneda Tales of Power is the name of one of them. They're, they're about this uh, this man's encounter, or the author's encounter with this Yaqui shaman, um, Don Juan, who teaches him mystic arts. And it is completely unclear if Don Juan ever existed. It seems very likely that these are sort of fabricated, not um, that they're not ethno- ethnographical, they're just invented. Um, but a lot of the training that... Um, uh, Carlos Castaneda describes undergoing gets directly mapped into the films as the force training. So, and, and a lot of, you know, so there's a reason that Obi-Wan Kenobi is like a shabby guy in the desert. That's, that's Don Juan. And Yoda was supposed to also be that in originally, he was supposed to be like a shabby old desert, desert rat as he's described in the script. Um, so yeah, Lucas is, is taking a lot of that zen stuff um and um and he's putting it directly in the films like and he's like holding up these books as like this is explicitly source material for the films that's right yeah and and obviously there's a, been a lot written about uh joseph campbell and the power of myth and the yeah. um and the uh and and the, the film series was joseph campbell as big before the films came out i mean i was again oh, I was I, my understanding is that the films played a big role in it, sort of firming up Joseph Campbell's uh, yeah. interpretive legacy. Um, so Joseph Campbell yeah. has this sort of uh, read of, you know, various mythological plots. They all involve the hero's journey. These are the 17 stations of the, you know, the cross or whatever. And yeah. Star Wars maps perfectly onto them. It's not the only film that does, um, but that that sort of the, the resonance between Star Wars and Campbell was, you know, was certainly huge for Campbell. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you've been really generous with your time, but we, we eventually we'll have to wrap up. Um, but, uh, um, I just wanted to, to also note that, um, at the beginning of the article, you, you do a really great job, sh- uh, charting some of the political references, um, from, uh, from Reagan to, I think Hillary Clinton, everyone sort of references Star Wars again, making that argument that it's so much in the, the, the culture that it's impossible in many ways to imagine, American culture without Star Wars. Yeah, um, that's right. So that's ingrained. Right. But um, um, any thoughts on any of the newer Star Wars films or TV shows? Are you have you 
watched any of them. I mean, I, I heard I heard Andor is the most ACAB thing ever. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I so I have not watched Andor, yeah. um, and and I've only watched a, a see. This is where I, I fail as a Star Wars fan. Yeah. Um, I mean, it seems like the thing that was interesting about Star Wars was that Lucas refused to hand over the rights, so it actually mm-hmm. had to. You know, I mean, there was all this kind of merchandising and novelizations, but but all of it was, you know, really had to be related or magnetically stuck to those three films. And that was Star Wars. And now Lucas finally has turned over the rights. And now, you know, the culture industry does exactly what the culture industry wants to do, which is a Star Wars for every occasion. Right. There's, a you know, like multiple TV shows going on at once, all these movies being made. You know, there's just no like cartoons. There's no stopping it. Um and they'll keep doing that until literally no one wants to buy any more more Star Wars stuff. If they don't do that, they're leaving money on the table. Do you, I mean, do you, so do you? You think it's like less historically significant now that it's, it's no longer the work of this one auteur that like you can really chart this individual coming out of Stockton, California, moving to the Bay Area, dealing with his experience, his relationship with the American War in Vietnam, and that uh, his hostility towards. Um, the man, the establishment with Hollywood and so yeah, forth. And I, I think the reason is it's not just that I think, you know, the auteur thing is so important. It's that right now we're, I mean, this is the same, this is the same thing with the Marvel universe. Every possible market that could be hit by these simultaneously is going to be hit. They're, they're just trying to flood the zone. So there's not, yep. it's less that there's a message of star Wars than like every message could, that could possibly be delivered will, will presumably be delivered. Um, so I think there's still some, juice left in star wars there's some kind of a set of associations that people make and that draws people into the universe but i think i mean it seems like the um the films and tv are just straying further and further not that they're kind of losing faith in the one true path but they're like they're exploring all of the possible ways to do it and you know you can you know we're gonna get like you know star wars comedy star wars soap opera like it's just everything is just gonna be sort of star wars color the the subaltern star wars yeah, and sure, that's a possibility too. And right, and and you know, if Andor is indeed you know picking up on a lot of the, um, you know, sort of BLM um, protest energy from the, you know, uh, from like 2020, like that. Yeah, I'm not shocked. There's a market there. Yeah, yeah. Um, as we as we wrap up, I've got um, two questions for you. These are the debriefing questions on new yeah. books. Um, uh, two suggestions of things for the audience to uh, to read related to this or or to watch. This yeah. Is a, so, a, you know, first of all, I just, I should probably plug the book that this um, essay is yeah. in because it's yeah, really tell, tell good. Us, could you tell us about the book? Yeah. So um, there, you know, you historians of U.S. foreign relations have been um, interested in ideology, right? What makes people do what they do, not just what makes decision makers write the white papers they do, but what sort of what are the undergirding assumptions? I think that's been a really fruitful set of questions to ask. Um, and so David Milne and um, uh, Chris McKnight Nichols just pulled together this extraordinary collection of new thought on culture and 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 ideology in U.S. foreign relations. Um, and it's, it's a really extraordinary collection. There's a lot of really good stuff in there. So, you know, the Star Wars pieces, that's, that's my contribution to it. Um, but you'll see, you know, it's spanning the whole, you know, from, you know, the colonial period uh, uh, to the present and with all kinds of approaches. Um, the other thing that I would like to give a shout out to, which is a book in this realm that just blew my mind, uh, was Sam Lebovic's A Righteous Smokescreen, mm. uh, which is a different kind of take on culture and empire. It's it's just a study of the the logistics and almost hydraulics of U.S. culture after World War II, how the United States gets so good at broadcasting its cultural messages while not receiving other countries' cultural messages. And so, I mean, that's kind of a sort of narcissistic pattern that we're familiar with, like people in the United States, like, you know, in voting for the president, they're basically voting for their commander in chief of the world. And yet they don't own passports. They don't travel. They don't speak languages. Like they seem like very provincial. Um, so Lebovic's book actually goes through not that just as a sort of, you know, way of living in the world, but actually like all the U S policy that has tried to produce that effect that has tried to make sure that the U S is very audible to all parts of the planet. Uh, and the rest of the planet is muffled, uh, within the borders of the United States. It's an absolutely fascinating book. Fantastic. Yeah. And then, um, finally, what are you working on now? Fire. 
fire. I'm writing a fire history of the United States and I'm really, really? excited. Yeah, absolutely. So it proceeds from uh, an observation or two observations. One is that uh, the United States, and this is more true before World War One, um, is the Saudi Arabia of wood. It's just like uh-huh. more wood than any other country. It's where mm-hmm. the tallest trees grow, the oldest trees are. Like every measure of wood magnitude it achieves its maximum in the United States. The country is totally heavily forested or most, most many parts of it are. Uh, and that is related to another fact, which is that, um, for quite a while, everything in the United States was constantly on fire, uh, because all of it was made out of wood, the cities, the, you know, the furniture, all that kind of stuff. So this is a book that tries to take that. I live live in Northern California. Yeah, You know, you know, this to be true. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I mean, obviously, you know, this is a book that's kind of written in the shadow of, or the glare of those fires. Um, but, um, it's it's a way of kind of projecting or or appreciating the sort of catastrophic aspects of the past. But once you start asking questions about fire, you get new stories about the Civil War, about yeah. you know religion, but like the Second Great Awakening, like just any anything you you've had a take on, it gets different once you ask what happens when you add fire to it. Oh, that that sounds fantastic. I'm having yeah, a time. Yeah, you do. You do. Yeah, you. I, I, I'm 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 very appreciative of of your uh, creative and energetic mind in, in oh, the field of history, and it's fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you chatting with me, Mike. What a pleasure! I'm so glad we had this conversation. Yeah. So um, this has been a conversation with, uh, with Daniel Imoar about his essay, "The Galactic Vietnam: Technology, Modernization, and Empire," in George Lucas's Star Wars. This appears in Ideology in U.S. Foreign Relations, New Histories, edited by David Milne and Christopher Nichols uh, with Columbia Press, uh, Columbia University Press 2022. And this has been an episode of New Books in History, a channel on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Michael Van of California State University, uh, Sacramento. Thank you for listening. And I can't help myself. Uh, may the force be with you. <laughs> may the force be with you. And also with you. Is that what we said? And also with you. <laughs> Is that what it is?